İyi akşamlar, hoş geldiniz. Picasso Konferansları'nda bu akşamki konuşmacımız İskoçya'da St. Andrews Üniversitesi'nden Peter Reed. Kendisi Fransız dil profesörü. Picasso ve edebiyatçılarla olan ilişkileri ve özellikle de şair olan arkadaşa boyunlarla olan ilişkileri üzerine bir uzman kendisi. Ve bu akşam bu konuda ilgili bilgilerini paylaşacağım. Yalnız kendisi özellikle rica ettiğim lütfen cep telefonlarını sıkmanızı bu akşam ve The Turkish translation comes from channel one. Well, first of all, I'd like to um, thank uh, Karim Beya and um, all the staff at the museum here for their welcome. It's a great pleasure for me to be here in Istanbul. Um, and I was very pleased to visit this beautiful exhibition and I'd like to thank you for being here this evening as well. Um, I'm going to speak about Picasso and the poets and I'm going to try and cover the period from symbolism, that's late 19th century, through to surrealism and beyond. So, the French poet Paul Eluard, who was a close friend of Picasso in the 1940s and 1950s, coined the phrase donner à voir to define the role of poetry. Eluard thus implied that poets direct our gaze, open our eyes, and teach us to see. Baudelaire in the 19th century. Apollinaire, Eluard, and many other poets in the 20th century have written beautifully and perceptively about the visual arts and have helped us to see better the works that really matter amidst the massive fray of contemporary creativity. By promoting and celebrating the work of visual artists, the poets have cast a line between literature and art, drawing them closer together. Pablo Picasso particularly enjoyed the company of poets and particularly valued their interest in his work. The poet André Salmon, for example, wrote that when he first met Picasso in 1905, he saw the artist as a sort of poet, or at least a man for whom poetry was singularly important. He recalled that Picasso immediately wanted to discuss literature with him. Picasso's ear for language was also confirmed by his long-standing dealer, Daniel Henri Kahnweiler, who said that Picasso had a very keen sense of French poetry. Apollinaire once told me, even several years ago, when he could hardly speak French, he was completely able to judge and to appreciate immediately the beauty of a poem. Picasso always preferred the company of poets. Some of his biographers have tended to present these poets as jesters at the court of Picasso, sycophantically circling the great master. Such a view tends to forget, however, that the poets whose company Picasso enjoyed were themselves all major creative forces in their own field. Picasso's friends included Max Jacob, Guillaume Apollinaire, Pierre Reverdy, Jean Cocteau, André Breton, Louis Aragon, Paul Éluard, René Char, and Jacques Prévert. Picasso's best friends were the best French poets of the 20th century. Their relationship with the artist was not based on hierarchy, but on mutual respect and emulation, usually laced with every type of humour. In Edinburgh, near where I live, in Scotland, we have the unpublished notebooks of Roland Penrose. Penrose was an English surrealist poet 
and a friend of Picasso's. He also wrote the first Picasso biography, published in 1958. In one of his notebooks, Penrose transcribed a conversation where he said to Picasso how strange it was that his best friends had usually been poets. Picasso replied, yes, but the painters are too stupid and their conversation is boring. So that's an unpublished quote from Picasso in a book from Scotland. Um, these notebooks are going to be published by my colleague Elizabeth Cowling, who was here speaking uh, very recently um, in Istanbul. So what I would like to do this evening is look at some aspects of Picasso's relationship with poets from his teenage years in Spain through to the 1950s. I'll speak about his creative relationship with Max Jacob, with Guillaume Apollinaire and with the Surrealists, and if we have time, with Pierre Reverti. I've just finished writing a new book for an American publisher about Picasso and Apollinaire, so I hope you'll excuse me if I spend a little more time on Apollinaire than on some of the others. So the first uh, picture we're looking at here is a drawing from 1899. So Picasso made this when he was 18 years old and living in Barcelona. And it's a satirical portrait of Jem Sabartes, who became Picasso's lifelong friend and also his secretary. And here, Picasso presents Sabartes as a typical young fin de siècle esthete. You see, it's titled. Poeta decadente. Um, Sabartes is standing in a graveyard at night, and in the background are the illuminated windows of a Gothic chapel reflected in a lake. So here's the window, here's the chapel, here's the lake. The drawing suggests a melancholy awareness of transience and mortality. The drawing is also, however, a witty catalogue of the fashionable clichés of late 19th century symbolist and decadent poetry. The poet himself is presented as pale, thin and narcissistic. He is extravagantly dressed in a long cape with a high collar and an ornate bow at his neck. In his left hand, like Orpheus, he is holding a lyre, which is, of course, a symbol of lyrical poetry. He is gazing at a single purple iris held delicately in his right hand. Picasso thus depicts his friend Sabartes as a Spanish Oscar Wilde and pokes fun at his literary pretensions. This drawing also confirms, however, that young Picasso knew and understood the values and imagery of symbolist and decadent literature, simply because he was able to satirise them so effectively. Nevertheless, symbolist aesthetics did infiltrate Picasso's painting. When Picasso moved to Paris in 1901, he developed a style which is known as his Blue Period. Okay. Thank you, Kay. So here's uh, mother and child. Uh, Picasso himself said that the blue period was triggered by the suicide in Paris of his friend Carlos Casagemas. Blue period paintings invariably represent static, sad and lonely figures. Such subjects are rooted in Spanish tradition. But there is a sense of hopeless routine and disillusion here of the sort that Baudelaire referred to as spleen. Here we see a poor blind man with bread and water. Blindness is a recurring theme in late 19th century symbolist writing. And indeed the great Belgian symbolist Maurice Mitterlanck wrote a play called Les Aveugles, or The Blind Men, about a group of blind people lost in a forest at night 
So you can imagine the static twilight atmosphere of such a play. Blindness for Metalank represented spiritual disorientation and disarray. Blue is also the quintessential colour of symbolist poetry. Blue, the colour of twilight and of the sky, came to imply a rejection of modern materialism and to symbolise a quest for elusive spiritual values. The greatest French symbolist poet, Stéphane Mallarmé, wrote a poem entitled L'Azur, which famously ended with the lines Où fuir dans la révolte inutile et perverse Je suis hanté, l'azur, l'azur, l'azur, l'azur. I translate that as, where can one fly to in pointless and perverse revolt? I am haunted. Azur, azur, azur, azur. Some of this heady mixture of hopelessness and revolt and much of the solipsistic, hazy blue atmosphere of symbolist aesthetics were incorporated by Picasso into his blue period painting. Now in Paris in 1901, Picasso met Max Jacob. Throughout the blue period, from 1901 to 1905, Max Jacob was Picasso's closest friend. Max became his tutor, helping him to learn French and also taking him to the theater and reading him French poetry. Max Jacob first, first used to read Picasso romantic poetry from the first half of the 19th century, and especially works by Alfred de Vigny, whose poems reportedly moved them both to tears. In the exhibition here, you'll have seen a powerful brown ink drawing of a crying woman. It's in the first room, and there's a woman's head, and she's wailing, crying, a brown ink drawing. I don't know if you can remember that. Well, there are other versions of that drawing which date from the same time, around 1902. On one of them, Picasso copied bibliographical details of Vigny's complete works. On the other drawing in this same series, Picasso noted the title of Vigny's poem, Moïse, which is about the biblical character, Moses. In that poem, Moses is represented as a heroic but solitary figure, uprooted, burdened by divine gifts, but also knowing that he would never reach his destination never enter the land of milk and honey. So Moses was presented by Vigny in his poem as the gifted romantic outsider. Both Picasso and Max Jacob could identify with that theme. Picasso in 1902 was uprooted and knew that he too was very gifted but he was also very poor, he was starving, and not at all sure that he would eventually be recognised or be successful. A year later, in 1903, Max Jacob and Picasso shared a flat together. And at that time, Max used to read Picasso poems from the 1860s and 1870s, so rather more modern poems, by Paul Verlaine. Verlaine used modern urban imagery and combined this with clear and melodious language, often in short poems. All this made his work accessible for Picasso. Max used to recite the poems slowly and theatrically to emphasize them, but also to help Picasso understand the French. In one of his sketchbooks, Picasso copied out Verlaine's poem 
Cortège. So this is Picasso's handwriting in one of his sketchbooks. Cortège means procession. The poem features a beautiful lady who is leading a procession that includes her pet monkey and a young black servant. In the same sketchbooks, same sketchbook, Picasso made drawings inspired by the poem. So first he copied out the poem and then he started to make drawings to illustrate the poem. Here is the lady from the poem with the black servant. And here is the lady with her retinue of servants. In this drawing, however, Picasso has introduced a new character, Harlequin, who is courting the lady. From these drawings, Picasso eventually produced his painting, The Marriage of Pierrette. <laughs> So I'm sorry, the slide has a, a line down the middle which shouldn't be there. So this is The Marriage of Pierrette from 1905. This is a very theatrical painting arranged to resemble a stage set. It includes a typical French love triangle with a young bride, Pierrette, a rich old husband, and his handsome young rival, Harlequin. It's a classic situation you can find quite commonly in plays by Molière, for example, and still sometimes today in French, theater, in French cinema. So Picasso has taken the literary material provided by Max Jacob namely French theatre and a poem by Verlaine, and he's added his own favourite character, Harlequin, borrowed from traditional Italian theatre. He has then adapted that material into his own narrative and created his own personal and original work of art. Max Jacob inspired Picasso, but Picasso also encouraged Max. Picasso told Max that his true vocation was to be a poet, and he persuaded Max Jacob to trust in that vocation and to give up his day job, which was working in a shop. In 1903, Picasso famously told Max Jacob, Vi comme les poètes, live like poets do. Max trusted his advice, stopped work at the shop, became a poverty-stricken professional poet and went on to write his masterpiece, the wonderful prose poems of Le Cornet à D, which is a collection of prose poems. It means the dice cup. Now, in 1904, Picasso moved into a new studio in Montmartre, in a creaky old wooden building that Max Jacob called the Bateau Lavoir because it resembled a laundry barge. Here is Picasso outside the Bateau Lavoir in 1904. He's 23 years old here and to me looks amazingly modern, it could be today. He always had a sense of style, Picasso. Uh, there he met a new French girlfriend, Fernand Olivier. And then in February 1905, he met the poet Guillaume Apollinaire in a cafe near Saint Lazare railway station. So here is a photo of Apollinaire taken by Picasso himself. This photo was printed from the original glass plate. As you can see, the plate has deteriorated. But we'll come back to this photo. Apollinaire and Picasso were about the same age, and they hit it off immediately. Picasso later recalled that they straight away started to use the informal to form of address, as if they had known each other for years 
There are some people Picasso never used to with. His dealer, Daniel Henri Kahnweiler, for example. But with Apollinaire, he used to from day one. They were close friends from the start. Apollinaire was half Polish, half Italian, and was born in Rome. So two long trajectories, beginning in Italy and Andalusia, led to this meeting in an English-style bar in the cultural capital of Europe, which was Paris. Apollinaire at that time was establishing a reputation as a poet and a journalist. He seemed to know everyone, and he had already written some of his best poems. Early in 1905, on a bright, cold day, Apollinaire visited the Bateau Lavoir for the first time. He described that event in his autobiographical novel, Le Poet Assassiné, The Assassinated Poet. So here is Apollinaire in a work of fiction describing his first visit to Picasso's studio. So I'm going to read you a passage from his novel where he describes his first visit to Picasso's studio. The young man entered a single story building. On the open door, there was a sign reading, Studios This Way. He took a corridor so dark and cold that he thought he was dying. And with all his willpower, clenching his teeth and his fists, he shattered eternity. Then suddenly he was again aware of time and the loudly ticking seconds of a clock he could now hear fell like pieces of glass and life took hold of him again as time resumed its flow. But as he got ready to knock on a door, his heart started pounding at the idea there might be, ne there might be nobody there. He knocked on the door and shouted, It's me, Konya Montal. And behind the door, the heavy step of a tired man or of someone carrying a very heavy load slowly came nearer. And when the door opened, in that sudden light, two beings were created and immediately married. Apollinaire's first visit to the Bateau Lavoir inspired this intense piece of writing. His entering the artist's studio is described as an initiatory experience, the crossing of a momentous threshold, leading to a moment of rebirth and revelation as friendship is transformed into union. Apollinaire here presents his friendship with Picasso as a kind of marriage. In a newspaper article, Apollinaire went on to describe Picasso as he appeared at that time in his blue electrician's jacket. And Apollinaire wrote, his studio filled with canvases representing mystical harlequins and drawings underfoot that anyone could take was the meeting place for all the young poets and all the young artists. Indeed, once Apollinaire had entered the Bateau Lavoir, other poets followed and Picasso found himself for the first time in Paris at the centre of a tight-knit group of friends. These included Apollinaire, Andai Salmon, Max Jacob, Maurice Kremnitz, Nicolas Deniker and his brother André, and Maurice Reynal. To welcome them, Picasso wrote on his door, in blue chalk, the words Au rendez-vous des poètes, which means the poet's café or the poet's meeting place. At the Bateau Lavoir, the poets were very entertaining and were also intellectually challenging. Picasso used to paint at night. During the day, he sometimes went to the circus or to local cafes, but more often his poet friends would gather in his studio and they would make their own entertainment. 
On those occasions, Picasso's studio resembled a private club specialising in songs, poetry and satire. Max Jacob was a star turn because he could play the piano and sing extracts from grand, grand opera and musical comedies. He also knew scenes from plays by Racine and Corneille, in which he used to act all the parts. The poets also used to take turns pretending to be Baudelaire and other famous visitors coming into the studio to look at Picasso's latest paintings. Through the window of the Bateau Lavoir, they actually used to see Degas and Renoir, the famous Impressionist artists, who at that time still lived in Montmartre. So Picasso and his friends looked out of the window, and walking past the window, climbing the steps of Rue Ravignon, they used to see Renoir and Degas. These venerable figures never came into Picasso's studio, but the poets watched them and then used to imitate them walking around the studio and commenting on Picasso's latest pictures. On Dai Salmon recalled, we would do Degas, we would do Victor Hugo. Max was priceless improvising a visit from Renoir. Now these private jokes and this typically French humour based on parody and wordplay were a way of bonding the group together. For Picasso, his place as host, welcoming the poets, signified integration and acceptance in bohemian but definitely Gallic company. Despite all the jokes and high spirits, Picasso and the poets were also workaholics. When they met, their usual word of greeting was, how's the work going? And the young poets would often read aloud their latest poems and discuss them. Max Jacob's usual comment was, still too symbolist. These young poets were determined to overturn the conventions of symbolism and invent a new language, images of railway trains, aircraft and street life replaced symbolist images of swans, flowers and pale solitary poets. The model for 19th century poet, poetry had been music. De la musique avant toute chose, wrote Verlaine. Music, first and foremost. The new poetry, created by Apollinaire and Max Jacob, increasingly emphasised strong visual imagery. So painting and the visual arts increasingly replaced music as a model for 20th century poetry. This shift allowed new forms of creative cross-fertilization between poetry and the visual arts. Now these considerations lead us into Picasso's Rose Period. In late 1904, and early 1905, Picasso's work began a process of radical change, which made it less moody and sentimental, and which led first to the Rose Period and then to Cubism. The Rose Period reflected Bateau Lavoir group identity in warmer colours and in scenes that represented family life and community. These new paintings were often set in a circus environment, so the atmosphere is still sometimes wistful or sad, but the work becomes more affirmative, with a stronger emphasis on group identity and artistic accomplishment. Uh, this young acrobat balancing on a ball, for example, became one of Picasso's favourite topics. Here is Harlequin's family from 1905. 
in spring 1905, Guillaume Apollinaire published two important articles on Picasso's blue and rose period works, where he emphasized the poetic qualities of paintings like these. Apollinaire also highlighted essential stylistic aspects, writing, for example, that the colors are matte as frescoes and the lines are firmly drawn. Apollinaire thus compared Picasso's powdery colors and delicate outlines to the wall paintings of antiquity and the Renaissance. Here, in Family of Acrobats with an Ape, for example, there are indeed direct echoes of Botticelli and Piero della Francesca, particularly in the faces and figures. If you know Botticelli's frescoes, you can see with the quality of the paint and the profile of the figures, uh, Picasso is paying tribute to the work of Piero della Francesca and Botticelli. Apollinaire also suggested that Picasso's work is steeped in Spanish Catholicism, even though the artist himself was not particularly religious. And he highlighted the close empathy between animals and humans in Picasso's circus paintings. Apollinaire was quite right. In Family of Acrobats with an Ape, you can see how the circus family recalls the New Testament story of the Holy Family, Joseph, Mary and Jesus, who were also poor, homeless travellers like these circus folk. In contrast with those religious connotations, however, the presence of the monkey adds a Darwinian joke. The baby and the monkey are deliberately positioned to suggest similarities between them and thus to recall Darwin's theories of evolution and the idea that man descended from the apes. Britain, we say sometimes. Picasso also painted larger groups of circus folk, as in this gouache painting, gouache and charcoal, where the characters are standing near a race course, which is a modern and realistic setting and just the place for these, perform these performers to find an audience. The race horses are, of course, inspired by the work of Duga. So the Bateau Lavois poets imitated Duga, but the jokes and charades also nourished and energized Picasso's work. The racehorse pastel led to this major composition, Family of Saltambank. This is a very large painting. The figures are life size, so it's much bigger than the gouache. It's very tall. And this painting in late 1905 was Picasso's greatest work. It's well over two meters tall. The race course here has disappeared, dissolving any reference to modern life. So the scene occurs outside time. The six characters in the painting are almost life size. They include Harlequin and a portly red clown. With them are a young adolescent acrobat, another boy, and a little girl dressed as a ballerina, all standing in a close group. Seated to the right is a young woman dressed in Mallorcan costume with an earthenware jar, balancing the composition. The ballerina's wicker basket, just here, echoes the woman's straw hat, reinforcing the composition's lopsided symmetry. Picasso referred to such patterns and symmetry as visual rhymes, thus implying an analogy between poetry and painting.
The girl holding Harlequin's hand confers a protective role on him, confirming the close-knit atmosphere. Harlequin has one hand behind his back and his gesture is important as he shows his open palm and slightly splayed fingers. Harlequin's hand thus matches the five characters in the group here. Picasso is suggesting that they are as united as the fingers of a hand, yet each is independent and separate. The characters to the left have the strongest colours and clearest outlines. Moving right, the characters seem increasingly pale and diaphanous, so the seated woman's face and neck are very white, and she appears ghostly and ethereal. The poetic aura of this painting is partly due to that mysterious haunted atmosphere where the ghostly and the living hesitate between reality and dream, between here and eternity. The German poet Rilke wrote a poem about this painting in his Duino Elegies, where he asked, but tell me, who are they, these travellers, more transient even than we are? Harlequin, in Family of Saltambank, is of course a self-portrait of Picasso. Given that fact, it is tempting to see the whole family of Saltambank as an allegorical image of the artist and the Bateau Lavoir poets. André Salmon encouraged this hypothesis by suggesting that the red clown resembled Apollinaire. Drawings reveal, however, that the corpulent clown was actually based on a real entertainer named El Tio Pepe Don Jose, 40 years old, meaning Papa Don Jose, who was the patriarch of a circus troupe. Nevertheless, Salmon was right to highlight the resemblance between the red clown and Apollinaire. The clown does not literally depict Apollinaire, just as the other characters do not literally represent Salmon, Max Jacob and Fernand Olivier. These fictional characters do, however, allegorically suggest Picasso, Apollinaire and their group. They are gathered together and facing a new century with no clearly traced paths to guide them. They are together, but each adult is also clearly alone. Despite their group identity, the creative act, according to Picasso, remained an essentially solitary activity. In November 1905, Apollinaire saluted this painting by sending Picasso a blue postcard whose only message was two poems. On one side, there was the poem Spectacle. On the other side was the poem Les Saltambanques. Both these poems feature groups of itinerant entertainers and they confirm how closely the inner mental landscapes of Picasso and Apollinaire correspond and overlap. Both men in their art and poetry feature circus performers wandering through space and time. I'll just read you perhaps a little bit of this poem, um, Les Saltambanques. So this was directly inspired by the large painting we were looking at. Apollinaire writes, Dans la plaine, au calme jardin, où s'éloignent les baladins, devant lui des auberges grises et les villages sans églises. Les plus petits sont vent devant, les autres suivent en rêvant. 
Chaque arbre fruitier se résigne quand de très loin ils lui font signe. Ils ont des poids ronds ou carrés, des tambours, des cerceaux dorés. L'ours et le singe, animaux sages, quêtent des sous sur leur passage. Now these characters, the saltimbanques, the circus performers, epitomize a crucial aspect of European modernism, where national frontiers and identities are dissolved by cultural mobility and intergeneric dialogue. Picasso kept Apollinaire's blue postcard inside a 1905 sketchbook, and it was rediscovered there after Picasso died. Apollinaire eventually included versions of both these poems in his book, Alcool. And these two poems became two of the most popular French poems of the 20th century. Now, the empathy between Picasso and Apollinaire is also apparent in the artist's many portraits of the poet. And I'd like to look at some of them with you now, quickly. Uh, before the First World War, Picasso was a keen photographer. He took two exceptional photographs of Apollinaire, both of them in 1910, in his Boulevard de Clichy studio. Here is Apollinaire, aged 30, seated in the artist's studio. Picasso has staged the photo to incorporate several emblems of the poet's identity. They include his trusty pipe, the book, or magazine open on his lap. Apollinaire was always reading. His hefty laced boots, big heavy boots. For Apollinaire, life was movement, and he used to write his poems as he walked the streets. And the watch chain on his waistcoat. And that confirms Max Jacob's description of Apollinaire's very broad chest crossed by a platinum watch chain. But it also reminds us that the most common theme in Apollinaire's poetry is time and transience. So, as in a Picasso still life, objects may be significant and meaningful. Here, they all express aspects of the poet's personality. Now, a main element in the photograph is the large wooden sculpture known as a tiki from the Marquesas Islands. So this is a South Sea Island sculpture. It shares the centre of the composition, like the poet's familiar, and as a focus of magic, occult forces. It transforms the photograph into an aesthetic manifesto and emphasises Picasso's and Apollinaire's shared passion for the tribal arts of Africa and Oceania. Apollinaire wrote extensively on tribal art, and Picasso used it as an inspiration for his own paintings and sculptures. Here is another photo of Apollinaire taken by Picasso, showing him with hands clasped, bright eyes, and a worried look. The photo is a bit out of focus. Picasso must have moved the camera. But this wobble, if you like, accentuates the sense of precarious instability in the poet's features. Behind the poet, looking over his right shoulder, again stands Picasso's tiki sculpture. So it's the same sculpture which has been moved up onto a shelf. These two photographs are carefully composed, are psychologically revealing, and they are redolent with fascinated fraternal empathy. They are themselves works of art. Better known and more numerous, however, are Picasso's distinctive drawings of Apollinaire. When Picasso met Apollinaire in 1905, the poet had an office job in the financial district of Paris, and he was still living at home with his mother. 
Here's a drawing of the poet that Picasso sent him in December 1905. In the background is the neoclassical Paris Stock Exchange building. So that's the Stock Exchange where, Picasso, where Apollinaire used to work. The poet, with bowler hats and overcoat, looks the epitome of a city gentleman. The Stock Exchange clock says 1 p.m. And Apollinaire also looks set for a long lunch break. He is followed by his mother's dog on a lead, an incongruity which highlights Apollinaire's dependent relationship with his mother. The books he has under each arm make plain his real priorities, and they highlight the predicament of a poet employed in the banking business. The caption reads, Je ne te vois plus. Tu es mort, Picasso. I don't see you anymore. Are you dead? Picasso. Picasso is requesting more visits from Apollinaire. The card also gently implies, however, the advice Picasso had already given to Max Jacob. Give up your day job. Live like poets do. Picasso often playfully ennobled Apollinaire or otherwise raised his status. On book plates, he crowned him king, Guillaume Apollinaire Rex. And this drawing suggests Apollinaire's legendary appetite for food and drink. That does not, however, prevent the crown from also signifying the true nobility of the poet's profession. Picasso also drew him as Pope on St. Peter's throne. The drawing reflects Apollinaire's origins in Rome his Polish Catholic background, and rumours about whether his father was a cardinal or a military officer with links to the Vatican. It also recognises, however, his tireless ability to pontificate on art, literature, or any random topic. Arrayed in all his plush vestments, Pope Guillaume also sports a conspicuous wristwatch this was a new gadget in those days and it reappears in other portraits of the poet. It's a sign of his modernity, but again emphasises his obsession with transience and time. Picasso also gave Apollinaire this portrait of himself being inducted into the Académie Française, which is the great bastion of the French literary establishment. Here he is reciting his maiden speech in regulation regalia with his pipe behind one ear. So this is a completely imaginary scene, of course. Uh, Picasso prophesying Apollinaire's glorious future. And here, finally, is Apollinaire as a coffee pot. Um, this drawing has disappeared. That's why I only have a black and white photograph of it. Um, we don't know where it is. We hope it will turn up again one day. Other caricatures depict Apollinaire as a sailor, a soldier, a bullfighter, a bodybuilder, and a duelist. All of them capture his anxious expression with wonderful graphic economy particularly his bright, worried eyes beneath arched and wavy eyebrows. Picasso encapsulated Apollinaire's inner insecurity, and this underlines the fact that these drawings have their serious side, exposing complex psychological truths. Their very diversity perspicaciously reflects Apollinaire's polymorphic personality, and the quest for identity that energises his writing. These caricatures are brilliantly observant, but they also served a significant function in the evolution of Picasso's art. In caricature, external appearance is distorted and remodelled to express essential reality. If that is true for caricature, 
It is also true for Cubism. Practicing caricature, Picasso was preparing for Cubism. Here is the Cubist portrait he drew of Apollinaire in 1913. It is sharp and multifaceted, like a well-cut diamond. Picasso gave this drawing to Apollinaire so he could use it as the frontispiece for Alcon. So this is Apollinaire's most famous book of poetry. And the frontispiece served to show this is a shocking modern work. During the First World War, Apollinaire fought in the trenches, so he was a war poet, and he was wounded in the head. Picasso drew this magnificent neoclassical portrait of him in 1916. Picasso used black chalk for this drawing, which is brimming with restrained emotion. He has clearly delineated the poet's head and face by going over them with a darker line, whereas the poet's uniform is lightly sketched. Discreetly apparent, pinned over his heart, is his Croix de Guerre, the medal he was awarded for his cool and courageous behaviour under fire. Apollinaire composed a poem about his Croix de Guerre, where he compared his experience in the trenches to the cross that Christ carried to Calvary. In that poem, referring to his medal, Apollinaire wrote, O cross of heavy torment, O cross of humble misery. This is the anti-heroic mood captured by Picasso, reflected in the noble an infinitely sad expression he attributes to the poet. He gave this drawing to, to Apollinaire so it could be used as the frontispiece for Calligram, his second major collection of poems, published in the year he died in 1918. Apollinaire also owned many other works by Picasso, all of them gifts from the painter. Picasso was always extremely generous to poets and very often used to give them presents. It was partly a gesture of empathy and friendship, but increasingly it was also because he knew that poets often have difficulty earning a living. This has not always been the case. There have been times when poetry was the most valued of all the arts. If we look back to some Islamic cultures, for example, if we go back to Baghdad and to Basra in the 8th century, successful poets there were famous and wealthy. In our time, that is much less true. So giving works of art became Picasso's way of compensating for the difference in market value between a good poem and a good painting. Through his generosity, he could rectify that injustice. One of the first presents he gave to Apollinaire in spring 1905 was this very striking engraving, The Frugal Repast. And we're lucky to be able to see another version of this same work in the exhibition here in Istanbul. Apollinaire liked to import everyday language into his poetry. So Picasso sometimes decorated everyday objects for the poet, like this woven cigarette case with a coat of arms and the poet's initials. That's a cigarette case painted by Picasso. Here is a card painted by Picasso to wish Apollinaire bonne fête. So Picasso used to send Apollinaire many paintings on postcards like this. And Max has signed in the bottom left-hand corner. Picasso just left him a little space down there, Max. Um, and finally, for this part of the lecture, 
Here is an impressive oil painting. This was Picasso's wedding present to Apollinaire in 1918. The poet hung this painting in his bedroom. It's a large painting, one meter thirty tall. The dominant colors are black, gray, white and green. But the blue of the musician's clothing recalls Apollinaire's army uniform. The human figure both plays and resembles the guitar. So you have him playing the guitar, but he himself resembles the guitar in the sound hole. Yeah. So Picasso creates a fascinating pattern of shifting, reflecting shapes and planes to suggest physical and spiritual unity between the musician and his instrument. He thus created a poetically apposite image for the bedroom of the poet and his new wife. Again, this painting is composed and structured like a poem. As Picasso himself put it, lines and shapes rhyme and animate each other. Again, poetry and painting are seen as analogous. When he died in November 1918, Apollinaire had no money, just 50 francs in the bank. There was no bathroom in Apollinaire's flat, just a zinc tub in the kitchen. Picasso by that time was already very rich. So Apollinaire lived very simply like a poet, but at the same time he owned an extraordinary collection of contemporary art which included over 100 works by Picasso. I'd now like to move forward and say something about Picasso and the Surrealist poets. The First World War shattered the artistic community, which had existed in Paris until 1914. Apollinaire died, Max Jacob, who was Jewish, converted to Catholicism and went to live in a monastery. The cultural atmosphere in Paris changed, became more abrasive, more sectarian. The cultural landscape was dominated by a new generation of poets who had lived through the First World War, and they formed a new movement known as Surrealism. Leading members of this iconoclastic generation included André Breton, and Louis Aragon. Surrealism was based on the idea of automatic writing, which implies free and spontaneous creativity without the control of logic or reason. Obviously influenced by Freud and psychoanalysis, automatic writing and automatic drawing were intended to liberate the creative potential of the human subconscious and produce works that would be as strange and revealing as dreams and nightmares. André Breton first encountered Picasso in the hallway of Apollinaire's flat on 8th of November 1918, the day before Apollinaire died. According to Picasso, Breton was in his army uniform was extremely courteous and seemed very sad about Apollinaire's failing health. They met again later that month at the premiere of Apollinaire's play, Colour of Time. For the next few years, they enjoyed a cordial relationship, strengthened by this shared Apollinaire connection. During the 1920s, Breton persistently tried to draw Picasso closer into the surrealist orbit. In 1923, Picasso provided Breton with a frontispiece for his book, Earthlight. So this is a portrait of Breton by Picasso. In 1924, Breton persuaded Jacques Doucet, the wealthy fashion designer, to buy Picasso's most important painting, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. 
A reproduction of the painting was published for the first time in France in the surrealist magazine La Révolution Surréaliste in July 1925. Since 1916, Picasso had been going through a neoclassical period, which began with this very affectionate portrait of Max Jacob. So here in 1916, drawing Max Jacob, Picasso started to draw like anger. He then went on to produce works like Reading the Letter, a major painting which is often thought of as an elegy for lost friends, particularly for Apollinaire. It's a rare subject in modern Western painting, friendship between two men. And this with the book, with the letter and a book here and the hat, it's thought to be an allegorical representation of the friendship between Picasso and Apollinaire. Then in 1924, Picasso's work suddenly became more violently aggressive. He produced this guitar, for example, where the body of the instrument is represented by a floor cloth, a piece of newspaper, and a floor cloth punctured with large nails whose points are directed towards the viewer. Andai Breton and his friends were thrilled by the dangerous voodoo power of Les Demoiselles d'Avignon or of Picasso's 1926 guitars. Picasso moved closer into surrealist orbit and so he found himself once more surrounded by poets such as Breton, Eluard, Aragon and Robert Desnos. Works like this 1927 sculpture entitled Metamorphosis are definitely surrealist. This sculpture shows a naked androgynous figure whose rational capacities have been overwhelmed by the all-consuming power of physical desire. So irrational desire completely inhabits this androgynous figure. Now, despite his alliance with the rising generation of younger poets, Picasso remained at most a libertarian surrealist. He never subscribed to surrealist doctrine or to manifesto commitments, and he never accepted the authority of André Breton. The founding principle of Breton surrealism was, as we've said, free expression of the subconscious and dreams. Picasso's sketchbooks, however, show that he thoroughly planned and prepared his paintings and sculptures in those graphic laboratories. He rarely relied on inspiration automatism. Consequently, Picasso's art is to surrealism what war is to politics, its continuation by other means. Picasso was, in fact, most surrealist in his own poetry. So I'm just going to say a little something about Picasso's own poetry. In May 1935, Picasso stopped painting for a whole year and devoted himself to writing hundreds of poems in French and Spanish producing startlingly surreal juxtapositions like the bowl of nail soup or the rat that nests in an eye socket. In Picasso's poetry, historical events, including the Spanish Civil War and the rise of fascism in Europe, are reflected in images of gangrene, executions, snails dressed as bishops, broken wings and children crying. Lines are loaded with nouns, and this creates a driving, percussive rhythm. But there are moments of tenderness and soft alliteration too. This poem of the 20th of November 1935 begins with images of rage and hatred on horseback. Quel rage vous salue si correctement. A cheval. 
sur sa haine. Sharp, aggressive sounds and an emphatic rhythm reinforce the anger in the imagery. What rage salutes you so courteously on its hatred. This is the courteous hatred of fascism. This is Franco in Spain. But Picasso then moves to thoughts of his girlfriend, Marie-Thérèse, and the softer sounds of fricatives and sibilance create a gentler mood. Fleur plus douce que le miel. MT, tu es mon feu de joie. The sounds support the sweet and warm colours, textures and perfume of love. Flower sweeter than honey. Marie-Thérèse, you are my joyful fire. Some of the poems There it goes. Like this one, are coloured and decorated like illuminated manuscripts. Picasso dissolves the frontier between poetry and painting. Picasso was wholeheartedly surrealist, not as a painter, but as a poet. Picasso eventually moved away from Andre Breton for political reasons. Aragon and Eluar, however, remained his friends for life. When Picasso joined the French Communist Party in October 1944, in the offices of the party newspaper, Humanité, his two sponsors were Aragon and Eluar. They both made speeches welcoming him into the fold. For Picasso, this event and this act of commitment was both political and poetic. Now to finish, I'm going to jump forward towards the end of what I have to say. So this is for my interpreter. I'm going to move forward now. Um, here on the left, we have a portrait by Picasso of the poet Pierre Reverdy. Picasso knew Reverdy <coughs> since 1911. And during the Second World War, Reverdy had remained silent. He published nothing. And Picasso saw this as an act of resistance. So in 1948, in order to help Reverdy, Picasso illustrated a book of poems by Reverdy called Le Chant des Morts. And you can see that what Picasso did was to take Reverdy's calligraphy and instead of drawing illustrations opposite the poems, he decided to enter into the poems, surround and infiltrate the poems with red lines, streaks and circles. But the poems themselves speak of red wounds, of weaving and ropes that bind. And so there is correspondence between the illustrations and the writing. Now, coming to my last paragraph, in conclusion, I would like to return to the notebooks of the English surrealist, who was Picasso's biographer, Roland Penrose. In 1954, Penrose was with Picasso and a group of friends in southwest France, near Perpignan. Picasso brought out a copy of this book, Le Chant des Morts, The Song of the Dead. Picasso said that Paul Eluard greatly admired this work. And Picasso said that he himself liked it better than any other of his illustrated books. Penrose then noted in his journal a comment which I would like to end this lecture with. So this is another unpublished comment. Penrose wrote, we went through it, Le Chant des Morts, on the floor, 
page by page, reading most of the poems. Ça, quand même, vous rend plus heureux et vous fait plus de bien que de lire les journaux. That makes you happier and does you more good than reading the newspapers, said Picasso, and went on to praise the powers of poetry. And I better end there. Thank you very much for your patience. Sorusu olan varsa mikrofona e, mikrofonla geleceğiz yanınıza. Good night. May I ask you if Anton Arto and Picasso knew each other at that years uh, in Paris? Um, I don't think they knew each other very well. They may have met, but um, Arto um, was a dissident surrealist. And uh, this meant that um, he was no longer frequenting the surrealist circle of Aragon and Eluard when Picasso was their close friends. Um, Arto was a difficult, angry man. And um, I don't think that Picasso knew him. If they met, they did not know each other well. But I'm sure that Picasso, who was very interested in theater and who wrote plays himself, will have very much admired Arto. Arto, Arto's hero was Alfred Jarry, the author of Ubu Roi, Alfred Jarry. And Alfred Jarry was also one of Picasso's heroes. So they had that in common. Um, I think the two strong personalities understood each other and they had a good relationship. But when Picasso joined the French Communist Party, André Breton became very angry because André Breton despised Stalin and Stalinism. André Breton was a man of the left, but he was closer to Trotsky, and he was a bit anarchistic as well. And so at the end of um, André Breton's life, Picasso and André Breton met in the 1950s in Cannes. They met on the street. And Picasso said hello, and he invited André Breton to come and visit him in his studio. And André Breton said, no, I have to go to the dentist. And they never met again. The audience is leaving. He was uh, selling it for very expensive, but it was just a way of, of showing his uh, absolute, um, you know, thing. 
contempt mm -hmm. to all these people who are just, you know, understanding nothing and just praising. I think this is your theory. No, I'm <laughs> Yeah. I was told that by a few people. This is, this is, by Renoir, I was told that by the of Renoir. Yeah, well, this is absolutely untrue. There's one thing, there's only one thing that Picasso really believed in. And he believed in that. He lived to be 93. And he believed in one thing all his life, and that was his work. And at the end of his life, he painted very fast. But it was because he knew time was running out. But his last paintings are very powerful expressionist works. Now very modern for their freedom and power. And two of his last paintings were self-portraits. Picasso painted himself as a skull, as a skull in Tête de Mort. And these are two of the most, these are his last works almost, and they are two of the most powerful works he ever made. So I believe that Picasso's last works are very great paintings, um, but I'm sure that uh, his dying day, what mattered to him most was his work. Yeah. Are these, uh, thank, thank you for this most magnificent, uh, magnificent lecture. Um, and are these um, uh, illustrated manuscripts uh, published? Where, where, in the Ecrit, where, where do we find those? Um, Le, Champ de, Le Champ yes. des Morts, for example. You can find Picasso's writing yes. in the with, Ecrit, yes. with, with his own illustrations. In, um, they have been published in a big book, yes. uh, which was published first in France and has also been published in English, an English edition. It's called Picasso Complete Writing, mm -hmm. but it's a very expensive book. Mm -hmm. Recently in Paris, there's a paperback edition of some of Picasso's poems. Mm -hmm. This came out just a few weeks ago. But there are only two or three illustrations, but it's a nice little book. Le Chant des Morts is very difficult to see. The text has been published mm -hmm. in paperback, mm -hmm. but not as calligraphy. Mm -hmm. What matters here right. is the calligraphy. Yes. And, and is there a principal reflection by Picasso that he wrote down about the relationship between calligraphy and writing and, um, and painting, because this is what's interesting. It's not an illustration, really. It's a, it's, is, there, is there something that he himself um, says about this relationship? Well, I know you have um, someone coming here to speak. Um, <laughs> On the 17th of March, okay. <laughs> you have um, a wonderful man from New York called Pepe Carmel, who's a specialist in Picasso's drawings particularly. And he's coming to speak on Picasso's calligraphy, writing as drawing. So uh, you, I will not be able to be here, <laughs> and I'm very sad about that. But maybe you will be lucky enough to come on the 17th of March and hear Pepe Carmel speak on that subject. And he can answer better than me. Uh, you told that he stopped painting at 1935. Yeah. And what was the inner triggering effect for that? This for Picasso? Yes, for Picasso. This was a desperate thing. He had been drawing since he was tiny, you know? He'd always drawn all his life. In 1935, he stopped drawing and stopped painting for a whole year. And this was because he was desperate. And he was desperate for two main reasons. First reason, politics, the rise of fascism in Europe. 
And he was very worried about that. He was, he was, as a young man, he had been an anarchist. And he was always interested in politics. And he was particularly worried for Spain. But I think there's a, another even more important reason, which was his love life, which was in chaos. And um, he wanted to divorce from his first wife, who was Russian, Olga. Um, but he could not divorce uh, because the law under which they married stated that if they divorced, he would have to give her half of everything he had. And so he could not divorce her, but he had another girlfriend, Dorama, who he had met, and he was also still with Marie-Thérèse, M.T., who he mentions in that poem. So he had three women. And uh, for Picasso, one woman was difficult, two women made life complicated, three women, he stopped painting. <laughs> true. That's what happened. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kerry. Yeah. Thank you very much.